Hello, judges. This presentation details our paper on remote work, fad, or future. In this briefing to the president, we analyzed the shifting American workforce as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. The first part of our paper estimates the percentage of workers whose jobs are remote ready in 2024 and 2027. We find that 28 to 44 percent of jobs in each of the five given cities are remote ready. In the second part of our paper, we consider the probability that an employer will choose virtual, in-person, or hybrid work, as well as the probability that an employee will work will work remotely or not by looking at individual preferences based on personality traits. We predict education and health services is the industry most likely to offer remote jobs and also the industry in which an employee is most likely to choose remote work. The third and final part of our model uses data from parts one and two to estimate the percentage of workers who will work remotely. Using this, we can determine the total impact of remote work on a city measured by environmental, economic, and happiness indices. Our findings reveal that Omaha is most positively impacted by remote work. Now Grayson will elaborate on part one. Yeah. All right. Um, thank you, Joy. So now moving on to part one of our model, where we're tasked to analyze the remote readiness of the five cities given to us in the M3 problem statement. So here are some of the key assumptions that drove a lot of our thinking for this problem. So assumption one focuses on the association that um, exists between average wage and remote readiness. So studies from the Bureau of Labor Statistics have shown that there's a significant difference between the average wage of remote capable and remote incapable jobs. So what we will try to do with this assumption is model that association between um, average wage and capability for remote work. Assumption 1.2 deals with the fact that a significant proportion of those remote capable jobs have transitioned to remote readiness in the last two years. And this is largely a byproduct of the COVID-19 pandemic, where a lot of the emphasis has been on remote work that, enabled, that enables continued productivity of a lot of workers while maintaining safety um, from COVID-19. And so assumptions four and five uh, allow us to create a model relating average wage over time. And so we see this model as approximately logistic, um, as said in assumption five, because there is some theoretical maximal cap beyond which average wage should not increase. And so we define that cap more clearly in assumption four as $80 an hour, which is a 50% increase from the current average hourly wage. And so we define this cap as 50%, a 50% increase, because we don't, we, like, we don't expect that average wage will increase beyond that value in the next five years, which is what we're past the model anyways. So here are some of the main parameters we use in this part of the model. So we have the 10 industries as defined by the M3 data set, and then the five cities that we're given to model remote readiness in. And so for each industry, city, and year, we can construct some function remote readiness that can return the remote readiness of that industry in that city in that year. And so using this, this becomes our equation that forms most of the part one model. So essentially what we're doing here is for each industry, we're computing the proportional contribution of that industry to the total city remote readiness. So we do this by multiplying the proportion of jobs in that industry by the remote readiness of that industry. And then by summing across all the industries in each city, we can find the remote readiness of the city. And so these two values we find in the uh, following ways. So so to find the proportion of workers in each industry in each city, we use the M3 data set to analyze the changing composition of the workforce in each of the five given cities. And so we, what we saw is that a lot of the trends appear to be roughly linear. So we opted to construct linear regressions uh, for the workers in each industry, um, constructing 50 regressions for the 10 industries and five cities. And so shown on this slide are two tables detailing our projections from these regressions for 2024 and 2027. To find the remote readiness of an industry, we used assumptions one, four, and five that we talked about earlier to create two nonlinear associations. The first between average wage and remote readiness, and the second to find remote average wage over time. And by substituting the former into the latter, we can create one conglomerate expression relating remote readiness of an industry over time. So with those two values, then, we can plug those into the earlier equation to reach this final table of results. So as we expected and said earlier, Omaha is indeed the city with, that is most, most remote ready, sorry, in 2024 and 2027. So now Gabe will start by talking about part two of our model. All right, thank you, Grayson. So now I'm moving on to part two of our model, remote control. 
Here are some of the key assumptions that we use in part two to drive our model. Assumption four talks about um, the uh, or how to find mean and standard deviation values for trades which we do not have data for. We find it justified to map um, each industry to the general US population, as all of these industries have many employees which are diverse and spread throughout the United States. Assumption five considers how the average worker is generally indifferent to working um, remotely. While the American workforce does have many opinions both for and against working remotely, if we consider the average worker in our calculations, they will be roughly indifferent. Um, Assumption six uh, talks about how home Wi-Fi speeds, conscientiousness, neuroticism, and commute time uh, we can be modeled normally. Uh, and this is in the case which we do not have a probability density function for. As most people tend to cluster around a moderate level for these traits, we find it that the distribution should be approximately symmetric and unimodal as common in other uh, population metrics. Our final key assumption, assumption seven, details how employers will weigh remote versus in-person work. Um, in a capitalistic society, it is nearly always advantageous for an employer to consider their productivity of the office level when deciding um, how their office will work. Uh, in this case, whether it'll be remote, in-person, or hybrid. Here are some of the key parameters that we use in part two of our model. Um, we will elaborate further on all these parameters, how they relate to each other, and our final answer. So now, uh, in many studies, and uh, including one from the Office of National Statistics, we find that the six traits that are most impactful uh, to deciding whether an employee will choose to work from home and their productivity at home were the three personality traits listed here, age, conscientiousness, and neuroticism, and the three environmental traits listed here, commute time, home Wi-Fi speed, and number of children. Conscientiousness and neuroticism are traits tested for in the Big Five Ocean Personality Test. Conscientiousness is the trait of being careful and diligent, correlated with better work from home performance. And neuroticism is the predisposition to negative thoughts and anxiety, correlated with worse work from home performance. As an example of how we would uh, analyze the environmental traits, if someone's commute time is higher, there is a lower probability that they would choose to work in the office and would rather work from home. So now to continue our discussion about part two, Andrew, please. Thank you, Gabe. So ultimately in our model, we wish to compute a probability that any worker who works at a remote ready job uh, will work from home. And so this is a quantity that we denoted in our paper as P sub WFH or P sub work from home. So in order to compute this value, we first deconstructed it into two separate probabilities, P of A sub J, uh, which we defined as the probability that uh, an employer would allow their employees to work from home in the first place, and G of A, the prop which we define as the probability that an employee would choose to work from home given the choice to do so. And so equation 13 on this slide allows us to synthesize these two separate probabilities and compute a numerical value for P sub WFH. Now, in order to compute these two separate probabilities, we ran a Monte Carlo simulation in Python. Uh, as is typical with most other Monte Carlo simulations, we, our general approach was to simulate a large number of employees in each of the separate job industries, and then uh, compute the number of such employees who would ultimately work from home. And so on this slide here, we detailed each of the four steps that we used for each generation of our simulation, uh, which we now dive into with more further detail. Step one. Uh, for our Monte Carlo simulation was to first assign a set of traits to each of the individual workers. So uh, on this slide here, we've outlined some of the mathematical notation that we use throughout our paper. Uh, in particular, we let script L uh, denote the set of all such, of all possible six tuples of the numerical values of the six traits that each worker could take on. So for example, uh, for each worker, we let L1 denote their age, we let L2 denote their number of children, and so forth. Uh, then we used, we constructed the function capital L, taking the set of all workers in a particular job industry to this set script L to assign each worker a, a particular element in script L, which we denoted as boldface A, which just denotes their uh, the value of the traits that they have. Now, in step two of our Monte Carlo simulation, we performed employee-side computations. So uh, in this step, we computed a value for G of A, which we recall is the probability that an employee would choose to work from home given the choice to do so by their employer. Uh, so the three traits that we considered in our computation for G sub A were the three environmental traits of commute time, number of children, and home Wi-Fi speed. Uh, we, uh, we considered these three traits in our computation for G sub A, for G of A, because we uh, considered these three traits to all 
clearly influence the propensity for an individual to work from home clearly in one direction. So for example, if we take home Wi-Fi speed, we felt that uh, an employee with a, sm a very slow home Wi-Fi speed will have a much smaller propensity to work from home than an employee with a home Wi-Fi speed that didn't necessarily interfere with the efficiency of their work. And so an important thing to note is that the same cannot necessarily be said about the three personality traits because these traits are more highly volatile and uh, contingent on external factors for us to be able to determine the direction in which they influence G of A. Therefore, we uh, did not consider their effects in our computation for G of A. Uh, and so Span and now we'll con continue our discussion for the rest of part two. Thank you, Andrew. So for part three, we calculate the probability that an employer will allow their employees to work from home. To do so, we define the ratio capital H of A, which is the ratio of an employee's productivity when they're working from home to when they're working in person. This ratio allows us to avoid calculating the dollar contributions of individual employees towards their company. Rather, it allows us to just be concerned about the relative ratios of their productivities, which is what we need to calculate in the end anyway. So here you can see on the slide how we calculate H of A, and at the top you can see that the four factors we use to adjust the relative productivity value are the number of children they have, their home Wi-Fi speed, their conscientiousness, and their neuroticism. And at the bottom you will see a dampening function that allows us to take into account the tendency for older individuals to be more resilient in terms of their work environment with respect to their productivity, meaning that younger individuals will have a harder time uh, keeping their productivity the same when adjusting to new work environments, whether it be in person or working from home. So finally, for step four, we synthesize all of our results using these three expressions, which detail the given productivities for the three work environments that we consider in the industry J. You will see that in each of these three expressions, there's a common double summation. The outer sum in each of these summations sums over all the employees in industry J, and the inner sum sums over all the employees that share the given set of traits, bold-faced A. And for each of them, we calculate the expected value of their productivity. For example, for the hybrid work model, we consider the probability that they would be working in person, multiply that by their productivity in person, do the same when they're working from home, and add those two up. So on this slide, you will see our results for the information industry shown through three histograms. For example, in the second histogram, you can see, you can see the differences between the employee's um, productivity in an in-person work model and a hybrid work model. And we can see that the results tend to cluster around negative four, which shows that individuals in the information industry tend to have higher productivities when they're working in a hybrid work model compared to an in-person work environment. Finally, for our results, you can see that education and health services, which is the industry highlighted in green, has the highest chances of going remote. And the two industries that have a 0% chance of going remote, as predicted by our model, are logging and manufacture, logging and mining, and manufacturing and construction. And this makes intuitive sense because these jobs are nearly impossible to do in a remote setting. Now, Joy will elaborate on part three. Thank you, Spandon. Now let's transition to part three of our paper, which asks for the rankings of the five given cities from most to least impacted by remote work. For assumption one, we use travel time for commuting to measure our environmental impact index because studies have shown that um, pollutants generated by traffic emissions were greatly reduced due to remote work. For assumption two, we use change in productivity to measure our economic index because studies have shown that working from home can increase productivity by up to 77%. Lastly, for assumption three, we realize that happiness is objecti objectively difficult to measure, so we use self-reported collected polls. However, we were unable to find data for some cities so we, so we, so we uh, use assumption four to find metrics by looking at larger regions. Most importantly, we chose to use these three indices because each index represents a different area in which remote work has had a substantial impact on. In part two, P sub WFH represents the probability that some random worker in each industry and city will work from home, whereas here we solely look at cities. Thus, from part two, we multiply P sub WFH of each industry by the proportion of jobs in a specific industry in a city and year, and then summing across all of these industries to find the probability a worker in a particular city will work from home. Using P sub RW, we can then compute our environmental, economic, and happiness indices relative to the amount of remote work in each city. We scale these factors from zero to one off of the highest score and then add all three indices to find a comparative total impact index. From the calculation of the total index, we determined that Omaha had the highest ranking due to high scores in all indices and Liverpool with the lowest ranking, as seen in the results in this table. As we reflect on our model, we, re we recognize that we were subject to some limitations. More specifically, at times, our model is an oversimplification due to lack of data. 
For instance, we consider that the employer and employee side of remote work to be independent, as it's logistically impossible to quantify the impacts of workplace environment and interactions on both decisions in every workplace across the country. However, we're proud to have created an overall robust model. We performed a sensitivity analysis by adjusting the computed values of P sub WFH so that the weight multiplied by the proportion of jobs in each industry is increased and decreased by 5%. The results of our sensitivity analysis show that our final rankings did not change, indicating that our model is resistant to small errors. Since part three is a synthesis of parts one and two, this sensitivity speaks to an overall strength of our model. Thank you for listening to our presentation. Great presentation, thanks guys. Um, I, so I have a question about the about your calculations. You had this employer side and employee side calculation.